Welcome to the third Creative Case panel discussion at uh, Decibel 2011. Um, we're talking about the Creative Case for Dance. And in particular, what we'll be looking at is working, um, how working with different diverse bodies um, has the capacity to innovate practice and to affect a cultural shift. Um, and I think um, when I came in, I saw the posters on the outside of the Zion Center, and they said, there was a whole wall that said, without deviation from the norm, progress is not possible. And I think they summed it up perfectly. This is exactly what it is. So instead of um, doing more introductory things, um, I'm going to hand straight over to our panel, which is Sandy Bourne, Catherine Long, and Luke Powell. You've got the biographies there. Um, and if I can invite Sandy, who will be talking about her research um, and give us an introduction to her work. Thank you. Hello, um, I'm just going to give you a historical overview from my research, so I'm just going to read it, so just bear with me. Okay, um, so in regards to uh, diversity of the, uh, the body in dance, I'm going to talk about black dancers and ballet. So historically, black dancers were pigeonholed into performing traditional and social dance forms. To break the mould, black, black students uh, who wanted to establish a career in modern dance styles were encouraged to train and perform in jazz, modern and contemporary dance companies. Research found that black dancers were discouraged from studying ballet owing to their perceived anatomy being considered unsuitable to perform ballet because their backs were too curved or their postures were too high. Um, arguably, some dancers from the diverse ethnicities have similar flawed anatomies and are also said to be incompatible to perform ballet. Historically, Eurocentric negative perceptions of the black body, for instance, illustrated in the images of the sexualization of Saji or Sarah Bartman or the hot and tot Venus, has not deterred black dancers from performing ballet. Early African American dance pioneers have proved to be exceptions to the rule and possess the ideal body to perform ballet, i.e. Uh, lean body, long neck, shortened torso, good turnout, hip mobility and long limbs. Ironically, research found that the iconic choreographer and co-founder of the New York City Ballet, George Balanchine, observed the suppleness of the black dancer body and it was inspired by this perception to remodel the image of the Eurocentric ideal dancer body when choosing his dances. This research was found in works by scholars, dance scholars Sally Baines and Brenda Dixon Gosschard. Possessing the right body to perform ballet was not the only obstacle these dancers <coughs> experienced. They also encountered other forms of discrimination as well. For example, Janet Collins was the first African-American dancer to perform with the Metropolitan Opera Ballet in 1951. Quote, she was told that either special parts would have to be created for her or she would have to paint her face white. Uh, ballerina Raven Wilkinson was the first African-American dancer to tour with Ballet Russe de Monte Carlo in 1954. Quote, in some cities she was forbidden to perform on the same stage with white dancers or stay at white hotels. Of course, the examples given of African-American dancers' experience was during the time of segregation in the United States. However, black dancers in Britain have also had similar reported experiences, similar reported experiences. For instance, in August 1979, it was reported in the Daily Mail that a talented dancer, Julie Felix, experienced discrimination from British ballet companies. She was a graduate from, the, from ballet uh, Rombus School and auditioned for the Royal Ballet and the English National Ballet, formerly known as the London Festival Ballet, but was unsuccessful because she was black. 
the then administrator of the London Festival Ballet, David Reeves, said, we feel it would be difficult to perform the accepted classics with a black girl in the court. It has nothing to do with prejudice. It could be argued that Reeves' explanation for not employing a black dancer at the time was an aesthetic decision, not a racist one. Of course, this article was written 32 years ago, and the historic concept of aesthetic minds of symmetry in art and its impact on choreography, which has shaped the corps de ballet, was, according to Lincoln Kirsten, dance scholar and co-founder of the New York City Ballet, was influenced by 18th century British painter William Hovegaard's book on the analysis of beauty, which was written in 1753. Surely a few black dancers performing in Swan Lake's corps de ballet uh, would not be an aesthetic issue today. Okay, um, let's go, go on to part of my research. I was looking at the roles um, that black dancers have performed. And part of my research, I examined the roles of Arthur Mitchell um, in his employment with the New York City Ballet which was, you know, well, many of the works were choreographed by George Banner's so that's between 1957 and 1970. So when Mitchell um, performed in Argonne, so in 1965, Mitchell was due to perform um, Balanchine's Pas de Deux, Argonne, with a white dancer, Diana Adams, on US te television. Uh, Mitchell was unable to perform the ballet because of the colour of his skin. Quote, television, Television stations in the South would refuse to carry the show. Research found when Mitchell cast, when Balanchine cast Mitchell for Argon, he racialized him on many levels. Artistically, the choreographic dynamics of the piece, in this instance, a black man manipulating the movements of a white woman, Adams. Uh, Balanchine portrayed an integrated partnership which was not accepted at the time. Aesthetically, Banishing also, also um, wanted contrasting skin tones. In a Midsummer Night's Dream, Mitchell performed the role of Puck, a mischievous elf in Banishing's ballet. Banishing racially stereotyped Mitchell when casting as Puck by eroticizing his costume. Um, performing a mischievous or tricky character offered a parallel negative representation of African-American men at the time. In the Nutcracker, and I'm talking about um, figure in the carpet, in the fairy tale, the Nutcracker, 1954, Mitchell performs the role of Arabian coffee, and in the, in the figure in the carpet, he performed as a black and more. Almost there, finishing. Um, Balashin may have created the roles of Pap, and the Blackamoor at the time because colour casting Mitchell made sense to him and therefore he replicated images of black people or narrative characters which are similar to skin tones of Mitchell as an example of the Nutcracker where he performed Arabian coffee. coffee. Uh, culturalist, cultural theorist Stuart Hall refers to this perception as, as part of the maintenance of social or and symbolic, symbolic order. He describes the symbolic order as symbolic boundaries that keep categories pure, giving cultures their unique meaning and identity. So, um, what, is the future, what does the future hold for black dancers when performing traditional roles in ballet? So, just to conclude, um, are Eurocentric perceptions of black ballet dancers still current? Does ethnicity matter in ballet? And to conclude, the points raised are only some of the issues explored in this area of research, and there's much more work to be done. That's it. Thank you, Sam. And now I'm handing over to Catherine, who's going to talk about her practice. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about my art practice and the research projects I've been doing at the Institute for Cognitive Neuroscience over the past two years. And 
I'm going to attempt to do it without getting too distracted by the noises coming through the walls behind me. Um, so forgive me if I uh, hesitate at any loud noises from there. Um, so as it says in my bio, I've been doing a two-year research project um, at the Institute for Cognitive Neuroscience in collaboration with uh, various people. And at the centre of my work is my bodily experience. And I focus on how we participate in the experience of other people's bodies. And um, I, I especially look at how we experience other people's bodies through our own individual physicality. And the project emerged out of the desire to investigate why I experience particular urges to move in ways that are actually impossible for my specific body. Um, and I wanted to look at what was happening in my brain and also what happens in other people's brains when they look at bodies that they don't identify or that they don't <coughs> recognise as being familiar. Um, and along the way, it, it, it became very apparent that all through my life, people have experienced my body as a site for their own loss. Because having been born without a left arm, people tend to assume that I've lost it or I've got something missing and they, they see what is absent before they see what is present. And that there's a real tension there that um, lies between other people's perception of my, my body and how I experience it on a personal level because I have many more issues uh, that restrict my mobility and um, the way that my body is formed. Actually, the, the, the absence of a left arm is not my prior sort of concern. But for other people it is. So I, I became very interested in uh, how, to, how to just navigate through this without sort of undermining my sense of wholeness. How to, how to look at what other people project onto a body with three limbs and look at, look at that very the essence of that and, and look at the urges that I experience without it then becoming sort of objectifying and, and medicalising. Um, and looking at very much more poetic and creative ways of engaging with the material that was coming from this. Because obviously, as being as a, an artist in residence with neuroscientists, I was putting myself in the position of being an object or a subject, um, which, which presented lots of contradictions for me and lots of dilemmas. Um, so these were all elements of the research that I, I kind of confronted and addressed in a physical way. Um, working with a dancer and interrogated some of the issues that were coming up in the research um, through movement and created a solo uh, and, and spent a lot of time sort of really delving into the issues that were coming up, um, very, very personal sort of experiences and um, it, it, I actually began this, this research about 10 years ago when I, when I decided to look at frustration, the experience of frustration that I experience, and also how I personally feel that there aren't words to really put to my physical experience. So in some ways it's a bit paradoxical sitting here trying to talk about it because it feels like there aren't actually words. Um, but this, the, this kind of then developed into uh, actually a, a dialogic practice, <laughs> and I've been engaged in dialogue um, with various people over the past two years, from, from different backgrounds with very different bodily experiences. So I've been talking to a transsexual um, male to female who's had male to female surgery, um, and uh, a non-adult on the autistic spectrum, and a psycholinguist, and a choreographer. And I've been looking at different languages and different ways of, of working with words and bodily experience and finding intersections and similarities and differences between how very, very different diverse bodies can relate to each other and different languages that we use to talk about these different experiences. Um, and yeah, so now, I'm just thinking if I've missed anything. <laughs> Um, now, I'm basically coming to the end of this project and I'm working on building an archive. Uh, we had a, a symposium and a performance event back in April as a sort of culmination of the research and um, 
there were speeches by and discussions by uh, a psycholinguist and a dancer and a scientist and myself and uh, a scholar and uh, we had Simone Forty who's a 75 year old amazing dancer come over from the States to perform as well. Um, so there was a real broad range of voices in the room and different dialogues taking place and so yeah, I'm working towards just building this archive of all the research that's happened and um, seeing where it goes next. Um, I think something that already strikes me in, in both of those is the, is the perception that the audience brings to what they see. So you have the, the, the black ballet dancer who's always going to be seen as black and that's going to be very loud in people's heads and the same thing. What you were saying, Catherine, about people seeing a loss, that isn't one that you perceive. So there's a there's a sense of what's the normalcy and the normal for the individual that could be brought forward. And instead what seems that there's a tension between what's perceived and what is actually lived. Um, so then next we have Luke Pell from Kamduko. Hi. Um, I'm what I wanted to kind of do was to share some thinking that's come out of very much having conversations with Catherine over time and Caroline Bodic who spoke earlier in the week and the research that Kanduko has been doing and also from hearing the crazy case and the various points that people raised on Monday. But there's one thing that I wanted to acknowledge first which I felt that I thought was interesting and that was to, to recognise that dance that comes out of a culture, so for example South Asian dance or um, East Asian dance practices or American um, modern dance or African people's dance is different to a diverse body trying to integrate within a dance form. So we have dance styles which come out of the culture, but actually what we've been talking about today is um, uh, people or bodies that interrupt those dance styles. And, and I think that perhaps has a different, a different connotation. Um, my work with Kanduka particularly is about to say the non-safe dancers dancing together within an existing art form and discipline that is essentially informed by ideals of modernity and mobility and has kind of a homogenous look in particular, um, historically, I guess. Um, so I was interested in this question of kind of, what does the diverse body offer dance? And you know, that was one of the things we are trying to articulate around the creative case. Um, so I tried to think of an example rather than going off on a kind of philosophical um, <laughs> tangent. And that was when Raphael Bonicella, who's a choreographer who's now based in Australia, worked with Kanduko Dance Company um, back in 2007. He made a piece um, with the company called Who Should Go to the Ball. There were two disabled dancers in the company at that time. And afterwards, he very explicitly articulated that working with disabled dancers changed the way he approached his choreographic practice. Because he had to begin in a different place. He found things that he, he didn't know he was going to find. And he then went on, and it was really clear to me when I saw the piece of work that he made with his own company afterwards, that what he'd learned from working with those dancers informed the way he approached choreographic tasks and exploration with his, with his dancers. So that, to me, feels like there's a potential example of what might difference offer dance. But that then brought me on to think about a kind of list of, I can think of, um, and I think we've both talked just now about, what seeing a different body or a diverse body of dance might offer an audience. So, for example, you know, there might be, depending on the reading of the body, and I think Karen, um, Catherine's research really engages with this, you know, we can't control how people might read our bodies. But, so, somebody might perceive the body as a specimen or as a victim. They might feel that it's a, it's a deeply moving and moral experience to see this body doing something that they have been brought up to think isn't possible. Um, so, there's a benefit there for the audience. Um, and then I thought that there's also this thing of, what diverse bodies in dance or interruptions to, um, to the dance form can offer the institution. So particularly in my work with Kanduka around learning and development is working with those people who already teach dance to revisit the values of their practice so that they can include other kinds of dancers. So thinking about not being kind of body specific or having a kind of corporeal hierarchy. Um, so there's lots of things that the diverse body offers other people. And I wonder, what does it offer diverse artists? What are diverse artists getting from their diversity? Um, these are just kind of my musings over the past few days. And I think lots of artists articulate that really clearly. But I think 
we're often thinking about what other people can get from this currency, this, uh, I think Kath talks about kind of the creative goals of, of disabled artists. And then that brought me on to thinking a little bit about when we begin to revisit the values that have informed a particular form, kind of the social political context of, of the time any art form comes out of. So if we think about where, where things were when, um, when ballet came about, that um, disabled people were institutionalized or killed, we didn't see them on the streets. And, you know, so that was what's happening socially and politically at that time, and therefore the people that were able to engage with that art form you know, were reflective of the people that were seen as valid within, within that time of society. If I think about Kanduko, and although the company um, didn't come out of it, wasn't a direct political response to the disability discrimination act and the change in law at that time, it happened that there was that kind of progress going on around legislation, and I think that was great momentum for the company. And so as the company turns 20 this year, we're certainly questioning, you know, what's the company's currency now? What's the social political context now for making work? Um, and then that brought me on to thinking, this is my final thoughts, um, is this thing of, because Kanduka happened by chance. Um, and a lot of the disabled artists that I haven't talked to, and I know Caroline Bowditch has talked to, they've, they've carved their pathways through into their art form in kind of a bespoke way. They haven't been able to pursue, or many people haven't been able to pursue the usual routes that their non-disabled pe peers have. And this really exciting, fascinating stuff has happened by chance, and people have had to really struggle. And much of my work now is about trying to formalise that, to try and help people to try and change the infrastructure, to try and um, look at the system, how we can let people through. But if I was to be reflective, I was wondering what happens if we remove that chance, if we take that chance encounter away, do we actually want to formalise everything? Isn't there something exciting about what happens out of a kind of counterculture or the possibility that you might not expect? And particularly when we think about the creative case, isn't the thing that the thing that interests us? So I think there's a fine line to tread around equality and actually destroying the thing that actually we're most interested in or homogenising that thing. Does that kind of make sense? That's where my thinking is today during Decibel. <laughs> Thank you. Great. To the audience to give um, any to ask any questions or make any comments that you want. Um, I have a couple of things to start us off in case you need a moment to go from listening to actually saying things, which I hope you will. Um, are there any questions or comments already? Yes. If you could say, if I could ask you to say who you are and then also do that while you climb out of uh, there. No, I'll stay here. Um, uh, I just wanted to um, respond to what you were saying about uh, not having things too formalised in order for people to be able to engage. I was just thinking about Chevelle Lynette, who's a black ballet dancer, and if there wasn't some kind of formal scheme by the English National Ballet Company in his school, he would never have become a ballet dancer because, you know, he's from Peckham. He has, like, no concept of how to even become a ballet dancer. So if something formal and structured hadn't entered his secondary school, he would never have become a ballet dancer and gone on to do Black Swan and some of the other projects that he's doing now. And I think he's one of the first black male dancers to get into the English National Ballet in that way, so there has to be some, I, I hear what you're saying, but also in terms of, like, if, maybe if he was um, middle class or if he was, if he went to a slightly different school, then maybe he would, he would know through family and friends how to step into that world, but because he wasn't, he, he wouldn't have had that opportunity if it were, do you see what I'm trying to say? Yeah, absolutely. And I think, um, I think it's really important, we, it was talked about earlier in the week about kind of how do we get a sense of entitlement, and yeah. if that hasn't been available to you, where do you go? And I think that equality of access is really important for people. I think the, there's sort of like two slightly separate thoughts for me, one about the quality of access to training and preparation, so that everybody has that opportunity to fulfil, fulfil their potential, 
but for example, talking about get, getting into EMB or to London or London Contemporary Dance School is about entering into an existing art form that's been based on the values of a particular body and particularly within the UK, kind of Western contemporary dance has this kind of Apollonian ideals or the ideals that Sandy was discussing earlier and I think the thing I was talking about chance was I was interested in what do diverse artists offer from their unique body, their unique physicality, their unique way of being in the world and how do we nurture that whilst also give people that kind of equal entitlement to the basic training they might require to develop those skills. Yeah, do you, does yeah. that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Then is there maybe something about uh, what ballet companies are doing currently that you're um, currently looking at in your research? Um, so far, like, um, I don't know your name. Joyce. Joyce was speaking about, yeah, I, I've spoken to Chevelle and <coughs> about the chance of dance scheme that, would, that happened in 1991. Yeah. Um, that was born out of um, uh, opportunities for diversity uh, to, to cry out for within the communities. So it's for BME groups. So that goes into schools throughout London, but so they're actually four boroughs. Yeah. So, um, and also, but, I mean, that's the only thing I can think of right now mm -hmm. for my research. and. Uh, also a ballet black form, so yeah. they're actually home with the English National Ballet, so that's the other part. Well, it's interesting, for instance, Mark Eli, who, who was a beneficiary of a project like that in the US, has come back to the UK and is very much an advocate for that kind of work here. Mm -hmm. This might also be a good moment to point out that Sandy is still looking for people to talk to about um, what's happening with ballet now in this country. So if you know someone who is interested in that, then this is the best to talk to. Now, Amanda. Yeah, um, but we're talking about formalised training opportunities, and um, but I think um, and then we got mixed up between um, training and uh, creating your own practice. So there's two different things there. Do um, diverse artists have a responsibility then to to offer a kind of a, a mentorship or a um, some sort of taking under their wing responsibility to, to support people coming through and is there a kind of formalised option for them or scheme or framework that, they, that can happen? Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, not as far as I know, Kanduke used to run a, a foundation course and the funding for that was withdrawn. Um, thinking about kind of opportunities, um, I think that Unlimited and the disabled artists are being supported through, through those bursaries. Um, over the next year and the profile they'll have yeah. and the potential influence they'll have for young people, there is a prime opportunity there for those artists to mentor and support people. But equally, that's a lot of responsibility to put on those artists as well as just being able to get on with their practice. And Unlimited is really about trying to allow those artists to have the resources that they perhaps haven't had before and to profile them. So then also to take on mentoring other emergent artists. You know, it's a, it's a big art. And I'm not saying that, that I think it's a really great way because I don't think anyone any better than those people who are on the ground. Um, I was interested when we were talking about um, agents for change in the terms of the crazy case as to whether are those agents for change big organisations that have high visibility and can kind of increase the message, or are those agents for change those people who have been working for a really long time to get their practice out there? So I think, in answer to your question, I think um, budding and mentor schemes are really important, but I also think we need to work very hard to try and open up, up formal training. But the responsibility should be placed on those artists. It should be placed upon all of us to share that responsibility. Yeah. Uh, Tony. Uh, well, to answer Luke firstly, it's both. Great. Uh, actually, more emphasis on the second, I think, from my point of view. Um, what I wanted to ask was, um, how would the panel describe the ideal relationship between so-called mainstream organisations and some of the so-called diverse-led dance organisations? raises the question for me about what's mainstream um, and you know when does the minority become the mainstream and um, that's 
I suppose that's just the first thing that sprang to mind when I hear that word. I'm like, well, what is mainstream? And um, just because something isn't geared towards a specific audience or isn't labelled in a specific way, then that doesn't necessarily mean. I don't know. I just, I, I, because personally, I never particularly label myself. I never say that I'm a disabled artist. I always use alternative language just because then it provokes thought. And, and I just. I work with my bodily experience, but I work with loads of other aspects of my life, and um, so I, yeah, I don't know. I just whenever I just whenever I hear the make word mainstream, that's just it just makes me question what that actually means. Could, could I rephrase my question at the As a panel, what would you like to see most happen in terms of creativity for within the within the dance sector? All right. Uh, <laughs> Okay, from a research perspective, um, I'm obviously looking at how ac accessibility for black dancers into mainstream and at what level does it stop? You know, where are the blocks? So, but mainstream will probably be saying, well, we're doing all we can to help um, communities like the, uh, the Chance of Dance Scheme. scheme that's to do with the Royal Ballet. So they're obviously going out into the community and trying to get young children onto the scheme. But obviously, something's not working because where are they? I mean, can anybody name a black dancer currently performing? Anybody in the audience? I'm throwing it to you. Somebody answer? No? Oh, that's what Austin's the nearest thing. Yeah. yeah, okay, yeah, we're going to say cars because, okay. Okay, and uh, I have a, a black British black British dancers apart from Chevelle. Yeah. So? Yeah, and what, which company? Um, with, with ballet, which is now in. Oh, I do Okay. Yeah, mainstream, ballet. mainstream British ballet companies. Oh, ballet. Ballet. Yeah. So nobody can. So obviously there's something happening there. Um, so what would be great is we, if, if that's in one aspect, but obviously the, the other aspect of um, colour casting, which I was talking about, or blind casting, you know, I didn't talk about it, but, but um, one of the reasons I was looking at Prakushka, I can't say properly, and uh, where um, black dancers and white dancers are being blacked up to perform traditional roles. You know, this is this may still be happening, you know. Um, and the roles of uh, black dancers of diverse, you know, different skin tones as well. That's also another problem because you know, I've heard that dance dancer won't name. He doesn't actually get to perform um, now uh, traditional dance roles because of his skin tones. And whilst you've got, and obviously Carlos Acosta gets to play everything at present. So, um, you know, it's actually looking at the traditional roles within the mainstream organisations. So, there's a lot of work to be done on both, both areas, but it's to find out uh, where the, the buck stops. I think that um, the thing about recruiting and identifying diverse dancers or diverse young people, we're talking um, on Monday about um, you know, those leaders. How are we going to find, my question is, how are we going to find those leaders when the resources aren't there to support them coming through? So if you're a disabled person or, or almost any diverse person, our education system is becoming much more difficult for those people to come through their sphere of influence in terms of their peers and their family. How do they have that information? Like, again, that sense of how do you get a sense of entitlement that you might be able to pursue this? So I'd really like to see that some work done around trying to, to kind of free up that area. I and mean, I think the other thing is for um, artists to be able to really articulate what it is their practice offers, but for major organisations to recognise that and engage with that and to have them in their organisations as artists rather than, because there's always been this kind of legal entitlement thing of, oh, we'll have an access officer, or we'll have somebody that will do the reasonable adjustment and tell us to put a ramp in. But actually, what's the kind of creative dialogue that you can be having? Right, that's fine. Uh, it's, a, it's a basic question of equality, obviously, and people having choices. So, if a, uh, a black person or a disabled person wants to um, career, uh, pursue a career in ballet or contemporary dance and they're being blocked 
because of discriminatory attitudes, whatever, seems to me that's utterly wrong. That choice should be open to them, that that's their choice. But I, mean, I think there's a bigger question, but I mean, I'm, you know, uh, I don't know a lot about dance, but do you think, does the panel think that the problem with the dominant aesthetic within, say, ballet or contemporary dance, because it's built upon this particularly narrow notion of what is the body and what is the body in, in, in dance, do you think, in one sense, that dominant aesthetic, it's, it needs to be taken apart or it needs some counter aesthetic to, uh, to, to rise up, because I'm, um, you know, in other words, is it so corrupted that it's not worth bothering about and really we need to be going down some other kind of path? Well, this is when I was reading your paper and, and the reason why Balanchi was interested in having a mixed race, a company that was integrated in terms of race, was his interest in, in jazz and influences yeah. like that. So there is, I don't know if you can say more about that, but there seem to be cracks where you can open it up and get a window. <laughs> But obviously at that time when, when Vanishing wanted, that was in like 1933, so that's a, I understand when you're coming, that, that isn't an example, but the reality is, was, wasn't going to happen then, and it's still not happening now, not to say it can't happen, but I, um, well, whilst everybody was talking, I, I just put down that, you know, that you're trying to work is to break down the barriers of perceptions, and that's what I think is key in all aspects that we were discussing. I think that's really, you know, so yes, it, there is work to be done and people need to be educated and they need to be uh, able to uh, view all sorts of works from diverse um, dancers, whether able, disabled or with whatever, and they need to be educated. So that's my that's, that's what I think. Um, I just think it's difficult because in reality, you know, people with non-normative bodies are not going to be able to do a lot of what the ballet dancers are able to do with, you know, with the sort of, when they've had, if they're, if they're able-bodied and, um, or non-disabled, however you might want to say it, but if they're trained ballet dancers and they don't have limited mobility and they don't have, you know, different issues going on, then Personally, I think it's sort of unrealistic of a person with a non-normative body that has restricted mobility or whatever to then expect to be in a conventional ballet company. But that, but if and, and I don't think there's anything wrong with with um, sort of the formalisation of, of ballet and everything, as long as it's, it can bump up against something that then challenges it or then dissects it or you know, um, really confronts the issues that are actually going on. So it's like, it's like um, how, the, how things are placed counter to each other and, and having those issues actually really interrogated and addressed is, is kind of the essential thing, I think. Okay, two questions. And I'm going to ask you to say them one after the other and then respond because we're, there's buses leaving. So. so just very quickly, kind of in relation to all of that, I wonder where you sort of feel the role lies in terms of young people who are being educated in dance already and being filtered off into different forms of dance because of attitude perhaps rather than love in terms of their body shape and things like that and where that line then comes in terms of saying actually I prefer to be a ballet dancer but you're telling me I'd be much better you know, you know street dance or whatever and where how that how that filters into this whole process in terms of even without an obvious restriction still being filtered into different forms that aren't necessarily where your love lies. Okay. And Catherine, you can... It wasn't a question, actually. It was a response to Tony's question. Okay. Do you want, do you want um, to... Or we moved on. <coughs> <coughs> well, it's, I think you know what you were going to say, so you have to say that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I suppose all I was going to say was I would, I would question the notion that, it's, that the problem is the form, is the classical form. Um, and the reason I would question whether that is the problem is because if you look at classical drama, the Royal Shakespeare Company has been casting minority ethnic actors for decades, absolutely decades. It's, it's never questioned. Um, so I suppose my question would be, why can't Royal Ballet, why can't English National Ballet, you know, what, what it's not about necessarily the classical form not accommodating 
difference. And that, in some ways, that kind of links to your question around preparation and entitlement, as in if people have been given the appropriate training and been signposted appropriately and been developed and nurtured, then those things might be possible. But if those, if that training, that preparation is, is that if there are barriers to those things for them, then we're never going to know. So if we begin to do that work that figures out, okay, so how do we train a dancer with a very different morphology to the dancers that we see at the moment, or how do we support dancers who come from a low income background? Etc. And we have people who are informed doing that signposting. I think that's the other thing. How do we inform people so people can make the right choices and give the right advice rather than oh, go and do street dance in the corner because it's cheaper or it's kind of closer to you or that's not just being described. Just street dance, that's just an example. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, I, I, I do have to draw it to a close. And what I wanted to do, um, because the creative case is about finding actions eventually, and we're just at the beginning of finding out really what the creative case means to us, and I thought from this, I was trying to put together what sort of germs of actions might have come from what we were saying, and some of the things I've written down was a, knowing where the barriers are, and then finding what we can do about them, and one of them was to find, to, to find ways of breaking down barriers of perception. One was what Luke just said about the informed signposters, uh, something about whether this dichotomy of mainstream and minority, how useful that is and how we want to use that. Um, the fact that agents for change can be all sorts of sizes, they can be individuals, they can be organizations. Um, the question around how much the responsibility could be, should be on individual artists to be role models, mentors, anything like that, that that's a very delicate individual calculation. Um, and I think what's come from all of the days since Monday and what, Luke, what we've said a few times now is how to create a sense of entitlement. So many stories have been about, oh, that's not for us. And it's the stories that the few people were able to tell us who did not listen and did say it is for me. So how do we create that sense of entitlement? So these are the things I think we now need to start doing. And then hopefully we'll find many more along the way. But I very, please, I want to thank very much our panel for